On this spotlight in black history, Joyce Heff, the black elderly enslaved woman who launched the showbiz career of Phineas Taylor P.T. Barnum. An acquaintance told P.T. Barnum about a traveling app that was up for sale. It featured Joyce Heff, a Negro woman who was presented as being 161 years old and the former slave of George Washington's father, Augustine Washington. R.W. Lindsay, Miss Heff's owner, had been exhibiting her in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and other towns and cities across the South, Ohio, and the Mid-Atlantic states, but couldn't turn a profit. Barnum rushed to Philadelphia to see the exhibition. After engaging Joyce Heff, Barnum was, quote, favorably struck, end quote, by her appearance after seeing her deeply wrinkled skin, which he called leathery. Barnum negotiated to purchase, or rather lease, Joyce Heff for $1,000 from R.W. Lindsay of Kentucky, who had purchased her from John S. Bowling's. But because slavery had been legally abolished in Pennsylvania in 1780, and in New York in 1827, the language used to describe Joyce Heff's quasi-legal bondage arrangement was a management lease. This was to cover up the slave trading activities of P.T. Barnum and R.W. Lindsay. Thus, Barnum began on his journey of deceptive marketing practices to cheat white audiences out of their money. Although Heff could move one of her hands at will, both legs and the other arm were paralyzed. She was totally blind, and her eyes were so deeply sunken in their sockets that they seemed to have disappeared altogether. She had a head full of thick, bushy gray hair, was very friendly and talkative, but weighed a mere 46 pounds. Heff was essentially a skeleton with skin who was completely dependent on her new master, P.T. Barnum, for her survival. Barnum referred to Joyce Heff as, quote, my black beauty to be commanded at my sovereign will and pleasure, end quote. Part of Barnum's elaborate promotion scheme was to garner as much money as he could by exploiting Joyce Heff's emaciated black body to give credibility to his hoax and to preempt criticism of Joyce Heff's frail body, Barnum published a bogus biography in 1835 titled The Life of Joyce Heff. The pamphlet was a mixture of reliable evidence and outlandish fiction that centered around Miss Heff's aged body. She was humanized to a certain extent, especially in terms of her exaggerated piety that she performed by praying in front of her audience each show. Pamphlet stories were one of the cheapest and most widely distributed formats for antebellum literature. This pamphlet claimed that Miss Heff was born in Madagascar on the southern coast of Africa to add an additional exotic touch to the hoax. It also gave background on how she allegedly became the nursing mammy to President George Washington. In addition to framing Joyce Heff around the historical significance of George Washington, Barnum was able to regularly convince penny newspapers and audiences that Miss Heff was 161 years old. Her debility and decrepit body helped to distract from the skeptics who thought Barnum created a hoax to not only entertain white audiences but to swindle them out of their money. Aside from the bogus background Barnum wrote in the life of Joyce Heff, he also confessed to the heinous acts he committed against her. When explaining her habits of consuming whiskey, he acknowledged he used it to control her. According to Barnum, quote, I soon got Joyce into training and from a devil of a term again conveyed into a most docile creature as willing to do my bidding as the slave of the lamp was to obey Aladdin. I discovered her weak point, whiskey. Her old master, of course, 
would indulge an old bedridden creature in no such luxury, and for a drop of it, I found I could mold her into anything, end quote. While she was inebriated, Barnum, quote, yanked out her teeth, end quote. Barnum's training included getting Miss Heff to memorize the story that he created, that she was, in fact, George Washington's nursing mammy. He also added in his pamphlet Miss Heff's other habits, which included drinking coffee, smoking tobacco, and a daily diet of, quote, a little weak tea, and cornbread with rare cooked eggs, which was served her three or four times a day. Coffee made very sweet was her drink between meals, which was given her as often as she asked for it, end quote. Barnum further humiliated Miss Heff and called into question her humanity in his bogus biography by claiming that she was extremely fond of animal food and frequently asked for it. Barnum furiously promoted George Heff as, quote, the greatest natural and national curiosity in the world, end quote. Barnum had a word for his style of showmanship, quote, humbug, end quote. A dishonest way of gulling people out of their money, he claimed his audiences enjoyed being fooled by his ingenuous deceptions. Although he never said, there's a sucker born every minute, his career and certainly his fortune hinged on this belief. While patrons gave testimonials assuring Ms. Hess' authenticity, Barnum decided to muddy the waters and further exploit Joyce Heth. He created another hoax within a hoax by writing an anonymous letter to the newspapers claiming Miss Heff was not a human being or even alive, that she was automated, that she was, quote, a deception cleverly made of Indian rubber, whale bone, and hidden springs. The ploy challenged people to flock to his shows to judge for themselves whether she was real or a hoax. Barnum's slick advertising tactics worked. Over 10,000 people came to see Joyce Heff when she debuted August 10, 1835 at New York City's Niblo's Garden, which was a two-week exhibition. Barnum began his show reading the bill of sale, purportedly verifying Joyce Heff was owned by Augustine Washington, George Washington's father, and that claim Miss Heff was little George's nursing mammy, followed by Miss Heff telling her story of caring for little George. Miss Heff was a good performer. Audience members asked her questions and cross-examined her answers. Barnum acknowledged that Joyce Heff was the best investment he had ever made. With a payment of $1,000, 500 of which he borrowed from a friend, he was able to bring in $1,500 per week in exhibition profits. In total, it is estimated that he amassed $50,000 for the seven consecutive months he exhibited Joyce Hell. Audience members regularly shook her hand, touched her skin, poked around her body. Some took her pulse and scrutinized her every wrinkle. One observer wrote, She is mere skeleton covered with skin, and her whole appearance very much resembles a mummy of the pharaohs taken entirely from the catacombs of Egypt. End quote. One article in the Evening Star mentioned, quote, Her nails are near an inch long, and the great toes, horny and thick like bone and incurvated, looking like the claws of a bird of prey, end quote. A transcripts newspaper reporter was fascinated to find that her eyes, quote, are entirely run out and closed, end quote. The popular New York Knowledge Magazine family went so far as to report that although, quote, food is administered to her regularly, evacuation occurred but once in a fortnight, end quote, once in a fortnight which means once every two weeks. This is concerning 
in that eliminating once every two weeks seems to suggest that she was undernourished and more than likely being starved to keep her looking emaciated and weighing 46 pounds. Penny Papers gave Barnum the means to reach a much wider audience. He managed to whip up a media frenzy that he used to his benefit. Even when editors called him a fraud, he used the negative publicity to sell more tickets to see Joyce Heth. Barnum exhibited Miss Heth in taverns, inns, museums, railway houses, and concert halls across the Northeast in Providence, Boston, Springfield, Hartford, Newark, Albany, and many, many towns in between, stopping back in New York several times. Abolitionists denounced Barnum's shows on humanitarian grounds, condemning the exploitation of a poor old slave for profit. Some clergy forbade their flock from attending the shows. In response to the criticisms, Barnum bamboozled another newspaper into publishing a fake piece advertising Miss Hess' cleanliness and religiousness to preempt further protests and to soothe the moral qualms of abolitionist ministers. The piece also described her rough treatment while living in chattel slavery and the more humane conditions she supposedly experienced while living with Barnum. Barnum normalized publicly degrading Joyce Heth, her blackness, age, and disabilities. He exaggerated her attributes, turning her into a character for entertainment on stages, in newspapers, on posters, and in antebellum literature. He popularized denigrating people who were different, and this gave rise to freak and minstrel shows. The first minstrel shows were performed in 1830 by white performers with blackened faces. Most used black cork or shoe polish and wore tattered clothing to imitate and mimic enslaved black Americans on southern plantations. They characterized black people as lazy, ignorant, superstitious, hypersexual, and prone to thievery and cowardice. Penny Papers covered Joyce's tour across the Northeast as the Mammy of George Washington. After seven consecutive months of being on display, Joyce Heth grew weak from the grueling schedule. She was like most enslaved people, worked to death. She died on February 19, 1836. In reality, Barnum had eagerly awaited her death. In fact, in his bogus memoirs, he described Joyce Heff as a, quote, remarkably old Negro woman who was swindling my friend R.W. Lindsay by her disgusting propensity to cling to life at his expense, end quote. Joyce Heff suffered two more indignities in death. One, a public autopsy, and two, her remains were on display in Barnum's American Museum. Barnum rented New York City's saloon on February 27, 1836, and in front of 1,500 spectators who paid a 50-cent admissions fee, watch Dr. L. Rogers examined Joyce Heth's body. Of course, without her permission, Rogers examined all parts of Miss Heth's body, including her brain. Many practitioners and students were in the audience. Her body was greatly emaciated, but Rogers found her organs to be normal size. Upon examining her lungs, he found small nodular lesions characteristic of tuberculosis on the left side which he thought had been there for a while. He presumed this was the cause of her death. As recounted in the New York Sun's article, quote, dissection of Joyce Heff, precious humbug exposed, end quote. The autopsy revealed by preponderance of the evidence that Joyce could not be older than 75 or 80 at the most. The grisly media coverage of Joyce Heff's autopsy was unsettling. It is unfortunate that it's just one incident in the many that shaped 
modern American culture in the continued dehumanization of black bodies. Barnum's path to fortune, fame, and notoriety hinged on victimizing Joyce Heff in life and in death to entertain white audiences. Barnum's method of exploitation shaped the modern American show business culture in terms of defining grotesqueness and creating a desire for white audiences to view it in otherness. This led him to form his world-famous greatest show on earth and its heir, the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. Barnum claimed he grossed $50,000 from exhibiting Joyce Heff over the seven consecutive months she was his slave. He was able to hire performers under his management and purchase a museum before her death. He kept Joyce Heff's remains on display in his museum until he suddenly had an attack of consciousness and became an abolitionist. Quote, the remains of Joyce were removed from the museum to Bethel, Connecticut and buried respectively, end quote. Pause here for more resources on Joyce Heff. As always, thank you for watching. Remember to follow and subscribe to the channel.